morning, church. Hey, my name is Josh Flores Olvera. I am the missions minister here at First Temple. Uh, welcome to all of you who are joining us online. Uh, thanks for taking time out of your morning to do so. So whether you're in the comfort of your home or uh, on the road traveling, uh, just be uh, know that we are thankful that you're joining us. And if you can, like, share, and subscribe, but don't text and drive. So do that. But hey, we are, get to start a new series, and um, th there's a sort of an inspiration uh, behind this series. Uh, in, the early in the early 90s, there was an author named, or there is an author named uh, Michael Connolly, who wrote a series of books about a fictional character named Harry Bosch. Harry Bosch was a homicide detective who uh, happened to be born to a prostitute. And at the age of eight, Harry's Bosch's mom was murdered. When he got to adulthood, he realized that his, uh, the case for his mom had not only not been solved, but it had actually never even been fully investigated. And so he goes in and, and, and enters uh, the criminal justice as a homicide detective, and he lives by this mantra where he says, either everybody counts or nobody counts. And so there's this conviction that Bosch has, right, that just because somebody, uh, as far as, like, society is concerned, uh, just because society says that this person doesn't have value, when it comes for that, to that person receiving justice or being treated with dignity, either everybody counts or nobody counts. And so today we start this five-week series and it's titled, Everybody Counts. And today we get to start off by talking about the image of God, or some people may know this as the Imago Dei. So what this is, is that like God from the beginning has placed his image in us. And when you, when you hear this phrase, the image of God and, and everybody counts, I imagine that in this room, uh, there's, there's probably two groups of people. The first group of people are those who ask themselves, what could God possibly want with someone like me? Maybe you feel like you've messed up too much, like you don't bring much to the table, like there's very little that you have to offer this world. But others of us in this room maybe feel a little slightly different about a certain group, people who vote differently from us, people who are of a different socioeconomic status, and that goes both ways. And for you, you are on, maybe asking yourselves from time to time, what could God possibly want to do with someone like that, with someone like them? So you may be in one group. You may be in a combination of the two. But let me remind you that God does not make disposable humans. God does not assign some people a starting role and other people cut from his team. In God's eyes, you count. God created you to be like him. And there's not one person that he looks at and says, man, I hope that person's not on my team. There's not one person that he looks at and says, yeah, I took a day off when that person was created. No, you count. I count. Everybody counts. So I brought this picture of a man that's very important to me, and I, and I know what you're thinking. That's a good-looking dude, uh, and, and, and that's because it's true. Uh, this is my paternal grandfather, um, and I mean, I mean, look at his style, y'all. I mean, come on. I, I, I don't know what year this is, but, but he, he's rocking it. I don't know what he's smoking. Sorry about that, but, uh, but the, 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 the dude's got it, right? And so let's, let's see the next group of pictures. Um, That's me. So I know what you're thinking. Man, Josh, you had such a great looking grandfather. You, you used to be so cute. What happened? Well, the shame and disappointment of being a Cowboys fan. That's, that's, that's what's happened to me, okay? That's, that's, that, that, that takes its toll on a person, okay? It's just a constant disappointment of being a Cowboys fan. That's what's happened. 
But I think when, when, when we talk about the image of God, right, for most of us, we, we think of something like this. There's some sort of physical resemblance. There's, you know, you can see like, oh, look, he's kind of dressed like his grandfather. There, you know, there's, you can kind of see where they connect physically and outwardly. And while, while par, part of that is true, when, when we talk about the image of God, there is a deeper, more profound thing that we are talking about. It's, it's more like when somebody tells you, or, or maybe you've, you've told somebody this, somebody says, hey, you remind me of someone. You may not look like that person, physically speaking, but there's something about the way you carry yourself. Maybe your mannerisms, your character, the way you talk. That reminds that person of someone else. So when the Bible talks about you and I being made in the image of God, it's talking about the fact that within every single one of us, we carry the potential, the ability, the capacity to do as our creator does and remind people of him. We have the ability to remind people of what God is like. Because we have this, we have a value unlike anything else in creation. The mountains don't get to do this. Fish don't get to do this. I'm sorry, y'all, but your puppy doesn't get to do this. Like, it is something unique that when God made you, God made humankind, that he placed his image in us. And because of that, you count, I count, everybody counts. So I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles to Genesis 1. We're not going to go very far. Um, we're just going to start off there at verse 26. You can also follow with me on the screens behind me. And it says this, Then God said, Let us make humans in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So depending where you are in the scriptures, right, like we didn't go very far into the Bible to see this sort of description of what is the image of God. But if you were to go to other parts of the Bible, you get a different vantage point about what it means to be created in the image of God. But today we're just going to focus on this vantage point, on, on, on the two things pointed out here in Genesis 1, 26, okay? The first one is that being made in God's image means we have the ability, the capacity, and the potential to embody God's character. It says they're according to our likeness. So what it means is that you and I are not only created to mirror the character of God, but that we actually have the ability, the capacity, the potential to do so. Like it's actually something that we can like have living within us, transforming us from the inside out, carrying with us wherever we go. So here's another thing I want you to know. Like when God created us, he created us, created us with the ability the capacity, and the potential to love unconditionally, to serve sacrificially, to give generously, to endure patiently, to know intimately, to forgive endlessly, to resolve conflict peacefully, and so on. We're capable of these actions because it was intentionally placed there by a God that embodies that. This was meant to be the norm. If you were alive during the time of Jesus, it wouldn't have been uncommon for you to walk around the city and see statues of the emperor. So whether you lived in ancient Israel or you lived in somewhere like modern-day Turkey, if you were under the rule of the Roman Empire it was not uncommon for you to just be walking up, you know, on the streets and see a statue to the Roman emperor. And what that served as was a reminder that as long as you were in the Roman Empire, the Roman 
rule reigned. The Roman way was the way of life. Well, if you remember, still in the book of Genesis, God says, don't make any idols. Don't make any images of me. And the reason why God asks us to not make images of him, to not worship idols, is because God has already made images of himself. It's you and it's me. And embedded into us is this capacity, this potential, this ability that wherever you and I are, we can serve as a reminder that the way of the kingdom of the God rules there as long as you and I are there. We have that potential. Last July, um, me and five members of our uh, church went to Gdansk, Poland to serve at a kids' camp there to teach English. And after we were done with the camp, we had a few hours to explore downtown Gdansk, and we happened to be there while there was this like two-week festival going on. And so um, think, think of it this way. Think of it like a, a ginormous farmer's market in all of downtown Austin. Okay, so it's, it's a pretty big festival. There's music, there's shops, there's food, like, and, and it takes up all of downtown. Okay. So Polish food is good, but man, I was, I was ready for something different, you know? So I'm, I'm walking around downtown Gdansk, just kind of looking around, and I, I don't read Polish, and so all I can do is read the images of the flags that are on these stands. And so if I see the Greece flag, I know that there's Greek food. If I see the Morocco flag, I know that that is Moroccan food. And lo and behold, the Holy Spirit leads me, and I see the Mexican flag. <laughs> oh, and there it is, and I'm just like, I'm home, you know? I'm like that, that stupid little squirrel from Ice Age with, with the acorn, like, here it is, you know? And I get so excited, because y'all, let me, can I quote Bane to y'all real quick? You merely adopted Mexican food, but I was born in it. I was bred by Mexican food. And so I go to this stand, and I go there, and I have never been more disappointed and mad in my life. Like, concession stand nachos were, would have been authentic compared to this Polish interpretation. I mean, I was expecting, like, tacos al pastor, and, like, all, all, like mole, pozole, like, you don't even know what I'm saying. But, like, like, I, like, all these things that I was expecting, and then I find their interpretation. That's a really bad one. Man. See, I know what Mexican food is like. I know what it tastes like. I know what it smells like. I know how it makes you feel. I know how it burns your mouth. I know what it's supposed to be like. And when God created you, and he created me, he placed in us the ability, the capacity, the potential to show people what it was meant to be like before the fall. He placed that in us so that we could show those around us what it was like for God to reign. So to an even higher degree, at a much deeper level, since the beginning, before you and I were born, he placed in us his likeness. Those norms that I mentioned earlier, the ability to love unconditionally, to serve sacrificially, to give generously, to endure patiently, to know intimately, forgive endlessly, and resolve conflict peacefully. That's there, guys. It's there. So you count. I count. Everybody counts. And the love of God affirms our worth from the beginning, we were created in the image of God. The second thing I want you to notice there in verse 26 is that being made in God's image means that we were meant to rule as Jesus demonstrated. So look there um, in, in verse 26. It says, let them have dominion. So that's the, the ruling part. Uh, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, the cattle, over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. 
So if you're like me, when I, when I hear that word ruling, right, I think of having too many chefs in the kitchen. I think of uh, a bunch of people trying to tell me what to do or people telling me to live my life, right? We're Texan. Like, we don't like that, right? So, like, it's all these people, like, intruding into my life, trying to control it. But when we look at the image of God as demonstrated to us in Jesus, Jesus came to earth, lived life as the perfect image of God, a perfect human, and he showed us that ruling was not meant to be from a palace, from a place of authority and position of power, but it was meant to be demonstrated through servant leadership. That when Jesus came to earth, he ruled among us by washing feet. When he ruled among us, he was hanging out with the rejects of society. When Jesus ruled among us, he was giving a place at the table those who had been rejected from society. That when Jesus ruled among us, those who were hungry found sustenance. That when Jesus ruled among us, those who were thirsty were satisfied. That those who were looking for what was missing found eternal life. And you and I were created not only to bear God's character, but to rule. Not from a place of authority, not from a palace or a position of power but through servant leadership. Two weeks ago, I was hanging hanging out with my wife watching preseason football because that's how desperate I got to to watch sports. And so I'm, I'm watching the Baltimore Ravens game. If you know anything about the Baltimore Ravens, over the last year or so, there's been a lot of talk about whether their quarterback, Lamar Jackson, was going to stay and they pay him a max contract, so a lot of money, or if he was gonna leave and another team was gonna pay him that money. Well, recently, the Baltimore Ravens decided that they were gonna pay him a max contract, and so he's staying in Baltimore. So the commentators are talking about how different of a team the Baltimore Ravens are with Lamar Jackson and without Lamar Jackson, and they show this stat there on the uh, TV. It says that when Lamar Jackson is quarterback for the Ravens, they are 45 and 16 which means they win 74% of their games. When Lamar Jackson is absent, injured, or whatever, not playing for the Ravens, they are 8 and 13, which means they win 38% of their games. So literally just by having Lamar Jackson in uh, the position of quarterback, it makes them twice as good. They are going to win twice as many like percentage-wise of their games, okay? Like it is clear that the Ravens are better when Lamar Jackson is present. God has given us that same capacity to make things flourish wherever it is that we're placed to rule. Look at the verse again. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all wild animals, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So if you notice what all this text is talking about, it literally leaves no part of creation unmentioned. If it's underwater, we rule it. If it's above water, we rule it. If it's on land, we rule it. If it's a domesticated animal, we rule it. If it's a wild animal, we rule it. There's literally no part. God has placed in you the image of God, the ability, the capacity, the potential to make literally all of creation flourish. That is in you. And because of that, you count. I count. Everybody counts. God has placed so much worth in you guys. Are you a janitor? Man, God has placed in you the ability to make your school flourish. Are you a doctor? God has placed in you the ability to make sick people flourish. Are you a single mom? God has placed in you the ability to make your household flourish. Are you a student? God has placed you in the classroom, 
He has given you the ability to make that classroom, that school, that team flourish. As people who bear the image of God. That is in you. The last thing I want you to remember this morning is that while we are made in the image of God, we need a savior. You know, it doesn't take long for us to to see in the world around us, and, and maybe even sometimes in the mirror, that the world isn't all that it should be. And even, even us, like humans, with our best intentions, sometimes still kind of tend to destroy things, ruin things. I'm not talking about just accidents, just like unintended consequences. We know that the world is not the way it should be. In 2020, uh, Netflix released a uh, documentary called The Social Dilemma. And it was a, a documentary talking about how social media has impacted society and like led to like the polarization and the chaos in society. And you know, you add that elections, you add to that COVID and all this stuff. Like, how did social media affect us all, and how is it wired to affect us? And so, there's a person that they uh, interview in in this documentary uh, named Justin Rosenstein. Justin Rosenstein is the inventor of the like button on Facebook. And this is what Justin had to say. When we, were make, when we were making the like button, our entire motivation was, can we spread positivity and love in the world? That idea, fast forward to today, or the idea that, fast forward to today, and teens would be getting depressed when they don't have enough likes, or it, would, or it could lead to political polarization was nowhere on our radar. It's like, raise your hands, like, I want participation. Like, how many of you would say, like, love and positivity is a great thing? Right. And here he says, like, when we invented that, that was our creation, and that was its purpose. But fast forward to today, and look at all these things that it became. The documentary goes on to say things like, people's personalities and character changed in an attempt to attract more likes on social networks. The lack of acknowledgement that teenagers might receive or not receive on their profile has caused increased anxiety, depression, self-harm, mental health issues, along with other major issues. And this is like the big idea that with the unregulated realm of the internet, a whole generation as a result has become more anxious, depressed, probable to self-harm and fragile. Even with our best intentions we still fall short. So here's the truth. You count, I count, everybody counts. Let me just speak to two different groups, okay? The first group I wanna speak to are those who do not have a relationship with Jesus. While God has placed his image in you, He has placed in you the potential, the capacity, the ability to embody his character and to make the creation around you flourish. We cannot, we will not get to the fullness of that apart from a relationship with Jesus. And if you do not have a relationship with Jesus, we would love to talk to you afterwards. Because if you want life at its fullest, it begins there. For those of you who do have a relationship with Jesus, allow me to encourage you for a second. We we will not be done being conformed to his image until we are with him in eternity. It is a process for the rest of your life. So don't become discouraged and give up just because of the repeated failures and mistakes you see in your life. God's mercies are new every morning. And there's not a single morning that he doesn't want you to come to him in spite of repeated failures. So let me tell you something. The image of God, the Imago Dei, is in you. You have the ability, the capacity, the potential to not only bear God's character, 
but make creation around you flourish. Therefore, friends, you count, I count, everybody counts. Let's pray. God, thank you for what you have invested in us. You have invested it all. You, you have gone all in. And so, Father, we thank you for your repeated mercy and investment in us. And we ask, God, that we would hear you in the way that we need to hear you, that we might love you just a little bit more today than we did yesterday. It's in your name we pray. Amen.